So you're a business owner and you do a great job. You want to expand your business, you make a hire. That hire quits in a week. And you're like, wow, that's really weird. Hopefully I do a better job next time. You hire another person, they quit too. You realize you're doing something wrong. So what do you do? You put in more effort. The next time you hire somebody, you have them shadow you for a while, like a long while. And when you finally delegate them out, their work quality declines either rapidly or eventually, and they quit too. You're staring at a problem, a you problem. You're making a mistake. I'm staring at the same problem now that I'm back running my organization after taking a year off. We have a huge problem that I have to fix. I have to take accountability for the fact that my company's not running how it should. Yours probably isn't either. And let's go over my mistake, probably the same one that you're making, which is how to get the people in your organization to uphold the same standard, uh, work ethic, quality of work, follow through, ownership, how to get them to take that all in just as if they were you. Well, spoiler alert, that's impossible, but we can plan for the fact that that's never gonna happen. I'm gonna teach you how to effectively lead people in a serious way in this video. I've built four multi-million dollar businesses over the last seven years, and then I retired for a year, I enjoyed it, but now I've gotta rebuild some stuff that's broken, and I've learned a lot of lessons on the way back in, and I'm gonna give you those lessons in this video. You will be a better business owner at the end of this video. So let's go. Welcome back YouTube world. Whether it's my area of expertise, my 150 Airbnb properties, or whether it's the newspaper company I used to own, whether it's the course sales product business I'm running as well right now, or any other business that you could possibly run, this is for you. For example, I just ordered Uber Eats and I'm seeing a lot of restaurants that don't actually exist. They're called ghost kitchens. There's one called the Hawaiian Bros and they seem to be everywhere. And what they are is a systemized value delivery structure, cook food, deliver it, and the primary way of getting customers is Uber Eats. You might be more familiar on Uber Eats with Mr. Beast's company. Yes, the Mr. Beast from YouTube, his company, Beast Burger. He's popped up all over the country with these you know, ghost kitchens delivering burgers through Uber Eats. So let's circle the drain on what we're trying to do in this video. We're trying to hire people, get them to take a rollover, be engaged with that position, feel you know, enriched by their job, hopefully show up to work every day, protect you and the company from any failures that could come from oversights or disengagement. The most expensive parts of running a business is having bad staff. If you've never read books on hiring, I really do recommend a book called Who? A Method for Hiring. I'll leave that in the description. And it really outlines how bad hiring the wrong people can get and how expensive it is to not fire those people. I also heard a Gary Vee quote on TikTok recently and it's something like hire fast, promote faster, and fire fastest. Where a lot of people say, um, hire slowly and fire quickly. Um, he's like, dude, we're fast paced. We're trying to find good people. And that does speak to a truth of our current culture, which is there are people who want to work for a winning team and they're out there and you need to find that. And it's really hard to master the interview process because there's so many different personality types, which if you would like to understand personality types, you can take your own. There's Myers-Briggs. I am an ENFP, but we'll go over that in a future video. But the moral of that story is people are insanely complex individuals. So the nuances of interviews can be tough, but people are also run by very basic needs, which is to make money, to survive, to feel like they are worth something like they're accepted by a group of people, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There's gonna be all sorts of stuff that we can really lean on and pull levers on. A lot of you guys don't know this, but I sold newspaper subscriptions for 12 years, maybe 13 years. And when I was running an organization, hiring sales staff, um, I picked up a interview question, which was, I want you to think of the first person that comes to mind when I say salesperson. Who do you think of? And a person would say something like Benjamin Franklin, Bernie Madoff, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, or whoever. And then the most important part of this is, why did you choose that person? And then the person would tell you, well, Bernie Madoff made a lot of money tricking people out of their money. Or Benjamin Franklin was able to create the United States through you know, garnering people's cooperation and getting them to buy into this idea. Either side of the fence is going to be correct for that person. What we're looking for is whether or not the person actually likes the idea of selling, where they think that selling is inherently good or inherently bad. And I'll tell you that that one question would tell me everything I need to know about hiring that one person. Because sales skills can be trained and a lot of people will fake that they want a job and that they have work ethic in order to get a paycheck. People are scared of not having a paycheck, so they will lie in their interviews. We have to find a couple of questions that get right down to the heart of who they are that they can't fake. And that one told me whether or not somebody would have a moral conflict with the practice of selling. People had a moral conflict with selling wouldn't stay the course. Now we hire people who didn't have conflicts with selling and some of them could not be trained to sell. They just didn't have that killer instinct, but some did. But that still cut away a majority of people that we would never want to hire. And this is really the best that you can do in the world that we're in now is you're looking for qualities of individual 
that fit culturally within your company, that their value structure fits within your company. So no matter which kind of company you run, you're gonna to wanna to find questions like that in your interview process that gets to the heart of who they are and whether or not they're gonna fit on your team or survive your leadership style, whether or not they're gonna think that scrubbing toilets is below them or not. And that's one of the things in my company, we've got a culture or had a year ago that everybody in the company scrubs toilets. When I first got into Airbnb, I was cleaning toilets every day. When Haley became my assistant, her first day we were scrubbing toilets. Haley did the same thing for her first um, and second managers. Kristen, who's still with the company today, she spent months doing housekeeping along with other tasks. There's a lot of people in our organization that did. But since I've been gone, we've hired housekeeping directors that won't do housekeeping. We've hired territory managers that won't do housekeeping. My Houston manager today, we had a conversation about how she's not the right fit for this company because she doesn't want to have to do housekeeping. We just let go of a housekeeping manager that wouldn't do housekeeping herself either. She could barely train a housekeeper and barely did a good job of doing quality control. I don't know how she got the job, but she got it while I was gone. Now, if you have your people shadow you for an extended period of time, that is a really good idea because you're going to deliver a lot more than just what it is that they're doing. You want to make sure that you internalize why you do what you do. When we hire our housekeepers, our first day of orientation, we're not teaching them how to clean. We're giving them all the information they would ever need to know about our company, our vision for the company, which vision we're gonna to get to later on in this video. It's actually super important. Why we're here, what it is that we do, and we're selling our housekeepers on why their position is the most important position with the organization. Now, if we have a customer service staff person that we hire, yes, we're also training them on why their position is the most important position in the organization. Everybody's position is the most important position and it should be to them the most important position. So if you don't have an onboarding system that really gets down to the brass tacks and checks all the boxes, and you're not elegant enough in that human resources side of your company, which you're starting to learn now, time and effort will do the job for the most part, as long as you're just a little tactful. So yes, have people shadow you, do the work that they're supposed to do with them, but beyond that, you need to be talking about your why. You need to be talking about why the position is so important. You need to talk about what you love about this position and what winning looks like. Another example, this what winning looks like concept, that internalization of the win is something that my company has lost touch with while I've been gone. Our teams have shifted from a hospitality mindset to a risk control, risk management mindset. And the reason why is our leadership team was getting burned out on bad guests. Sure, we need to respond and try to keep bad guests at bay if we can, but we started to treat every single guest who would ever stay with us like they were capable of being a bad guest. And that's a terrible foot to get started off on with any guest. We're trying to wow them with the magic, right? Give them that Disney experience. And that is something that we've lost. What a win looks like for our team got abstracted, which the team thought that the win was preventing people from doing bad stuff. They were no longer focused on making sure that the guest was in love with their experience. So when I started seeing messages come across my phone while I started working with this company again, I started to see that people's responses were very just curt and condescending even. Somebody would ask for a clarification on their check-in and that person would go, we've already sent you the check-in guide, please refer to your previous message. But the most impressive thing that a customer service staff could have done if they knew what a win looks like would be, oh, this guest may not be smart, they may be confused, it may be their first time, let me do everything possible in this moment to take them as far as they need with this one area of concern. So they could go and take a couple screenshots of the check-in guide um, and get the answer to their question. Somebody's like, what's my apartment number? Or what's the code to get inside? Customer service staff could copy and paste the check-in guide again and say, hey, here's your full check-in guide for your reference. Your apartment number is 15 and your door code is 1234 or something like that. I am here for you if you need anything else, okay? Thank you so much. You know, something like that, they, that just, that's better. That's still not even the best that they could do, but that's so much better than saying, we've already sent you your check-in guide. So if you are training a customer service representative, make it very clear what that win looks like. Not only the why, but how they could be the most outstanding customer service person ever. And they want to want to be the most outstanding customer service person ever. That's gonna have to be important too. This is where your leadership comes into play. You need to act in a way that inspires emulation. You want people to copy you, not just the tasks, that you're doing, not just the steps, but copy the philosophy, the personal sense of pride, that feeling of importance, what we do every day, the satisfaction from completing the task the right way. You want to have people emulate that. It is almost impossible for somebody without a lot of experience in hiring to just hire A players with a high success rate. But I can tell you there's something true about A players. They want to work for a company where their work is valued and they're capable of contributing to being part of a winning team, one that just crushes the industry. A players want to exist 
in the winner's circle. And if you do not lead with these virtues, with these attributes where people want to copy you to become the best, A players will quickly see that they're not working for a leader that's capable of taking them all the way and they will quit. The absence of A players within your company could very clearly be just because you don't know how to get someone to walk the walk with you because you're not walking with conviction. You might just be so tired because your company's been so hard to run on your own that you're in such a hurry to get a position filled that you're racing to get somebody trained at the bare minimum that you need to train them just so that way you can be sure that they'll do stuff without you and then you go run off and work on something else. But you haven't built that emotional connection as a leader and you haven't been somebody worth following this whole time. At this point, there's another book I wanna to recommend to you called Multipliers. It's one of my other favorite books. It talks about how somebody so great can either crush the soul of a person that works for them or multiply their ability. You want to drive your vision. You want to be meticulous and thorough with the adoption of that vision. And what's powerful about making vision a reference point for your staff is that if they don't know literally how to do something, they should already be armed with the idea of what we're trying to do and what winning looks like. And so they can make the leap of faith to take action without you having to tell them literally what to do. How many of you have hired people and they just seem to always ask you questions and wait for an answer without doing anything? And thus things don't really ever happen at any pace because no one will do any original work without you telling them what that should look like. This is because they don't have that vision and they don't feel the sense of confidence and ownership as part of manifesting that vision. So they're not gonna take the leap of faith to do something because they're more afraid about getting in trouble than they are excited about doing something right. This may be where you need to check yourself as a business owner. You may find that you're not capable of giving somebody enough space, enough fresh air to make original decisions or take original action. And the only people who will work for you are those people who wanna tuck away and not operate with any sense of leadership, originality, accountability, or anything like that. So get out a piece of paper, get out a pen, and write it down. What is your vision for your company? What are you trying to build? If you can paint a picture, and make a very clear future picture, I call it a future memory, and I try to draw the straightest line between myself and my future memory. And then along that line, I try to establish waypoints or goals. And there's another book for this called Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business. And they talk about how the further out you go, the harder it is to like really clearly state what that goal is gonna look like. You have to be flexible long-term, but you can have very, very real waypoints in the near future. But I still try to paint this very vivid future memory of what that organization should look like in the future. And through that imagery, I'm able to set those waypoints all the way back to where I am today. So on that sheet of paper, you know, your vision, why are we here? What are we trying to do? What does success look like? How do we deliver value within the organization? Is it a guest check-in like mine? Somebody shows up, they put their bags on the floor, they jump onto the bed, they turn on the TV, they cook themselves a meal. That is a win where somebody just settles in and they're comfortable in my organization. In my last organization, the one that died during COVID in the newspaper industry, a win for us there was somebody seeing that journalism is an important part of culture and that without journalism, the only thing we'll ever get is free content where somebody's trying to influence you all the time or trying to get some ad revenue. Now in my education products business, what is successful for me here is that I educate a ton of you with free content and you guys grow a company. In my world, it's an Airbnb business. You pick up a few properties and you run into things that are very clearly hard for you. But now that you're finally making money, if you need to pay a coach, you already trust me. I've already delivered some value and you pay me for some coaching coaching and I'll take you to the next level, but only with that pre-established amount of trust that comes from the free content. And you'd be surprised that that trust from the free content where somebody's willing to buy in what I have to say, buy into all of my advice, they get much faster action than if some stranger came off the street said, hey, Sean, I heard you were a great coach. I want to buy your course and do things. Some people who love to take action can still be successful, but that that connection that I have with my students who have seen my content for a year, they get results so fast because they don't have to dial in with my educational style at bare minimum. And with these various companies as an example, all the people that I hire now can fall in line. Hiring sales staff and teaching them what selling looks like, teaching them the art of influence, body language, neuro-linguistic programming, positive affirmations, deal with rejection, having people who do turnovers take a sense of ownership for the fact that a property should look like it's in like new condition and ready to impress before the next guest shows up. Not just that it has to be clean, right? And that the customer service staff need to be prepared to help anybody bridge the knowledge or aptitude gap to get into our property and not be frustrated on arrival with the check-in process, with trying to figure out how the HVAC works or the internet works. With our customer service staff, we made a playful model, which is that intelligence is not required to stay at Pat Suites. And we need to kind of laugh off the fact that we get really dumb questions when people travel. 
You just have to go for it. Now in the education products business, we have a virtue that our sales staff will turn people away and ask them to start with free content if they're not ready for paid content because we want to preserve the education products industry because there's a lot of people out there doing some grody stuff. We're gonna have a part two on this, all right? Because I don't wanna make this too long. If you have questions about running an organization at all, mostly Airbnb, but I've built multiple businesses, put them in the comments. I would love to help educate you guys as business owners, make you better, make you stronger. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you on the other side.